公公众管理学院的一位老师，呃，从翻山哈里斯是我们邀请来的非常尊贵的客人，呃，呃，当今这个世界啊，我们现在搞的是市场经济，我们处在一个市场社会之中，新自由主义。可以说是我们现在全世界的一种主流的思想观念和意识形态，呃，而哈德森教授呢，他是一位真正的新自由主义的批判者，是一位真正的马克思主义者。尽管这个马克思主义在在我们中国和在欧洲和在美国，恐怕有他很多不同的理解。我想同学们今天晚上应该从。这个哈德森教授那里了解到很多马克思主义最新的在西方的发展。我简单的介绍一下这个哈德森教授他的经历。他是本科毕业于芝加哥大学哲学系，主攻德国哲学和历史。随后在纽约大学经济学获得经济学硕士，论文是关于。世界银行的发展哲学。呃，接下来在纽约大学获得经济学博士学位，他的论文是关于十九世纪美国的经济和技术思想。他现在有很多很多的 title 头衔啊，我就只是介绍几个最重要的。他曾经担任过加拿大政府顾问、联合国顾问、纽约社会科学新学院，就是 New School 教授。哈佛大学研究员和纽约大学经济系访问教授，并担任德国柏林经济学院、瑞典斯德哥尔摩经济学院客座教授、密苏里堪萨斯校区、密苏里大学堪萨斯校区经济系杰出研究教授。他的名字叫哈德森，大家都知道纽约有一个哈德森 River， 他跟这个哈德森 River 有着很密切的关系。他是纽约哈德逊河的发现者亨利。哈德逊的直直系后裔，有一半的爱尔兰血统，四分之一的瑞士血统，八分之一的印第安血统和八分之一的英国血统，所以说他的这个家族是有着非常丰富的经历，背非常丰富的背景。他与美国独立战争时期著名的英国海军上将豪伯爵 Richard h a l l 有血缘关系。由于哈德逊教授的父亲是一位真正的马克思主义者，是美国托洛斯基共产主义联盟的成员，并曾经参加领导了一九三四年明明尼苏达州政府 m a n i p o l i s 卡车工人大罢工，所以他的小时候家里面经常会有联邦调查局和中央情报局的人员光临，所以说和我们也有着相似的这个革命经历。那么他。学术方面，他是最早对新自由主义 （New Liberalism） 进行批判的学者之一，并且很有可能是这个词 “New Liberal” 本身这个词它的发明者。早在呃九十年代初期的时候，他就已经开始对这个这种这种思想观念和这种政策进行进行批评。呃，另外呢，他还曾曾经在俄国杜马、澳大利亚议会都做过专题的演讲。这次呢，到我们中国来，他这是第一次到中国。尽管我们中国是个社会主义国家，其实还是有很多可以，就是给他提供作为他的研究背景啊，也也受到我们国家的这个高级国家高高级领导人的接见，也给我们中国在当前面对这个金融危机的这个背景下，我们能够做些什么，给我们的中央政府也提供了很多很好的建议。呃，他对美国政府、美国政策是持。非常强烈的一种批判的态度，这是真正的一个独立的知识分子、独立的学者所应当做的啊。呃，那么下面呢，我就把这个宝贵的时间留给我们的哈里森教授。I've been asked to talk about the global financial crisis. And what it means for China, and、uh, what you can do about it.、Uh, I want to start by pointing to something you all know. 
how much uh, China has been able to export and how much it's been able to earn in its uh, central bank. Uh, China now uh, has built up reserves of two trillion dollars. This is usually viewed as a sign of success, and it is a sign of success of how much you've been able to produce and export. But um, uh, there are some problems about this uh, that many of you may not have thought about. Uh, when I've been talking to Chinese for the last two weeks, people have asked me, uh, America's worried about the fact that uh, we have become so successful. Is America a military threat? And what very few people realize is who finances the American military? Who pays for America's military bases all over the world? It's China. China is paying for America's military. You see, they don't want me to say this, but I'm right uh, I'll tell you how the system works. When uh, central banks like that of China or Japan or Europe uh, get export proceeds, when they gain foreign reserves, what do central banks do with them? They buy uh, government bonds of other governments. And there's only one government that is so deeply in debt, that owes so much money, that it issues bonds year after year and decade after decade to run a budget deficit. Only one country in the world runs a steady budget deficit, a steady balance of payments deficit, a steady trade deficit, huge military spending deficit, and uh, it, its uh, investors are moving money out of their currency. And that's the United States. The United States now owe, the government now owes $4 trillion to other countries. $4 trillion. Half of that, $2 trillion, is owed to China. And uh, $1 trillion is owed to Japan. And $1 trillion is owed to other countries. This is a, almost half of the entire gross national product of America for an entire year. There is no way in which America can pay back this $4 trillion. Because, as I just said, America uh, became neoliberal three decades ago, and to be neoliberal means you deindustrialize in America. You, uh, you make money not by adding to capital, not by investing in factories and equipment, but by carving them up, by selling them off, and making a profit by uh, essentially uh, bankers uh, taking over. Neoliberalism means basically borrowing money to buy assets already in place. And uh, the neoliberals basically are spokesmen for the banks. And what banks uh, produce as a product all over the world is debt. So neoliberalism are salesmen for debt. You can think of them that way in every country, in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia. And the United States is so deeply in debt now that uh, living standards for American workers have not gone up since 1979. In other words, uh, 30 years ago, uh, living standards for workers were, uh, have been steadily going down. And yet, gross uh, domestic product is going to go on top. All of this increase in gross domestic product has gone to the wealthiest uh, layer of America, not to the people as a whole. In 1979, 1% of Americans owned 37% of the returns to wealth. In other words, if you take all the interest and dividends and rent and capital gains, in America, 37% of this went to just 1% of the people in 1979. 25 years later, after the neoliberalism began in 1980, really, this 1% of the population got 57% of the returns to wealth, from 37 to 57% in just 25 years. That's the most concentrated uh, element of wealth that you've ever had since statistics began to be collected. And today, it's estimated that 1% of Americans own two-thirds of all of the returns to wealth. America is becoming a more and more unequal society. And it's unequal because it's following uh, neoliberal policies. 
Now, many Chinese uh, students have asked me, how do we become more like America? And the America you're thinking about is the America of the 19th century that became an industrial power by being protectionist and protecting us labor and promoting high wages and uh, taxing the land and having a spirit of progressive income taxation and equality. The America today is not like it was in the 19th century. It's not like it was in the 1930s. It's been reversing all of what it was in the 1930s. It calls this socialism. And many Americans think that all this wealth they have was just created in the last 30 years, since 1979. And, uh, they, and what really has happened is that uh, all the wealth that America accumulated in the 19th century, in the 20th century, all the roads and electric utilities, and cities and sidewalks, has simply been carved up and, and given to insiders, outside, insiders to take over. And the insiders have gone to banks and they borrow from banks for the loans and they'll bid against each other for property, for buildings, for electric companies, for the public enterprises being sold off. And the winner of the, the people is, is whoever is willing to calculate how much rent they can squeeze out of the building, how, many, uh, how much money they can squeeze out of a road, and they pledge it all to the bank in order to get the money, to uh, borrow the money, to buy these assets. And uh, they hope uh, that they're willing to give the bank all of this rent because they hope that they'll make a profit later on when they sell the building or sell the, prop the property at a capital gain. So the way that wealth is being created in the United States is simply by buying and selling assets. It's not by building factories. It's not by employing labor. Uh, yesterday, the employment figures came out uh, for the United States. More than 10% of Americans are unemployed, according to the statistics. And if you count the people who have given up looking for work, the unemployment rate there is 17%. Uh, as you, about two-thirds of Americans own their own homes, about the same as in Canada and uh, Australia and England. However, 10 million Americans are estimated as going to lose their homes in the next year because they can't pay their mortgages. And there's a problem. Of American mortgages, uh, uh, one quarter of all American mortgages, the mortgage debt is larger than the uh, price that uh, people can sell. So people are walking away from the homes. Why would anybody stay in the house when you can walk away and leave the bank with uh, stuff, with holding the house, and uh, people are now beginning to rent. So one quarter of American property uh, is about to be abandoned, walked away from. Uh, the situation is so bad that in many cities, like Cleveland, Ohio, uh, there are vacant buildings on every block. When buildings are vacant, vandals come in, drug people move in, uh, trucks will uh, pull up the vacant buildings, and they'll take out all the copper wiring, they'll strip them, and the mayor of Cleveland has now uh, charged the banks with being a public nuisance for causing all the abandonment and nuisances. And yet, uh, I see that nobody in China is discussing the problems that America's got into. And if you ask people, how will America get out of this problem? The answer is, we'll just sell more to China, we'll borrow more money from China, China will bail us out. But in fact, most of the money that America borrows from China, the two trillion, it spends on military bases throughout the world, surrounding Asia with military bases. Now the money from China is, is paid for America's war in Iraq and it's paid for America's war in Afghanistan. And so you think that, well, look at China. You have a, a US government bonds, and they used to be as good as gold, when America would give gold. Since uh, the Vietnam War, America hasn't given gold for anything. What uh, China's central bank is getting is simply paper currency, and the joke is that America exports paper currency, paper to China, and gets from you all of the consumer goods and the uh, other products uh, that you're selling to them. Uh, this doesn't seem to be a very good deal uh, to many people. 
And many Americans are wondering how long uh, this can go on. I have a question. Am I talking too fast? No? Okay. Uh, I know that I'm moving my ideas very fast, and I'm trying to summarize all my ideas in about an hour and a half. And, uh -huh. My translator wants me to go slow. Uh, the, it used to be, when I went, uh, began my study economics 50 years ago, uh, every economic student had to study the history of economic thought and economic history. When the neoliberals came in, they said you can't study it. They dropped economic thought from the curriculum. Today, economic students don't study the history of economic thought, and they don't study uh, economic history. The result is say th uh, that neoliberals believe in the ideas of Adam Smith. How many people believe, uh, have been told that neoliberals believe what Adam Smith believed? Well, if none of you do, that's good. The neoliberals in China and the rest of the world hate Adam Smith. Everything they're fighting for is the opposite of everything Adam Smith wrote. And if you read Adam Smith, you would know that they are fighting against everything Adam Smith stood for. They're fighting against everything that uh, John Stuart Mill stood for, against everything the classical economics fought for. They are leading a revolution. They are not leading you forward. They are leading you back into serfdom. Many of you may have heard the book, The New Road to, the, uh, the Road to Serfdom, by Frederick Hayek. Uh, Hayek said uh, that uh, government spending is the road to serfdom. Government spending is what made America rich, it's what made Europe rich, it's what built the roads, the railways, the hospitals, uh, all of the public uh, enterprise that you see. Everything that was built up until 30 years ago, in the last 4,000 years of Chinese history, has been called the road to serfdom. What Mr. Hayek says is instead of having the government doing the planning, you should let the banks do the planning. If you just uh, demolish government, and let planning be done by the banks, then you won't have serfdom. But what Americans are finding, what Europeans are finding, and what Australians are finding, is that what Hayek uh, recommends, that is the road to serfdom, and what in America they call debt canage. In other words, if you let banks do the planning, their idea of planning is very short term. They want to get uh, people to borrow from them. They want to lend money against real estate and they protect uh, their, their, their customers. The banks in the United States have promoted uh, untaxing of land, and so uh, untaxing of property. Up until 1930, states and cities in the United States got 70% of their revenue their, uh, from the property tax. Today, they only get one-sixth of their revenue from the property tax. The neoliberals have urged a reduction in the property tax. They said that this would lower the price of property, but it hasn't done that. Uh, and uh, this is economic nonsense. When uh, the government lowers the tax on land, that leaves more of the land rent, which is set by the marketplace, to be pledged to the banks. So whatever the tax collector gives up ends up being paid for interest. So if uh, you see an attractive house, that you want to buy, you bid against other people for the house, and uh, the rental value is uh, uh, essentially paid to the bank for a mortgage because uh, you probably don't have the money to buy the house yourself, so you go to a bank and you borrow the money to buy the house, and you end up, uh, the winner of the bidding for the house is the person who uh, pays all of the rental value to the bank. And so, uh, the idea is that every economy is planned. Planned is forward thinking. Planned is deciding if you're a farmer, when are you going to plant the crops, when are you going to harvest them. If you're in your own life, you're planning how much you're going to save, when are you going to go to school, when are you going to retire. 
every economy is planned. And the question is, who is going to do the plan? Will it be the government? Will it be the banks? Or will it be a mixture between the two? Just a break. Let me break? Yeah. Uh, no, no, not break. Stop for a while, and I explain this to students. Okay. okay. 好，同学们，我还是简单的给大家就是解释一下。那么他刚才所讲了半天呢，其实都是在批评，呃，从七九年以来的这种新自由主义的政策。他谈到了，呃，在七九年的时候，当时是美国有百分之百分之一的人口掌握了百分之三十七的财富，但是呢，到了现在二十年以后。推行了新自由主义。七九年、八零年，李登上台以后，那么世界的这个局势就发生了变化。以前西方国家也搞的是这个国有化或者是政府管制。那么七九年、八零八零年以后，那么西方国家它搞的也是这个解除管制 （deregulation） 和自由化 （privatization）。那么二十年以后呢？现在的情况就是百分之一的人口掌握了百分之五十七的财富。二十年以前是百分之一的人口掌握百分之三十七的财富。所以说，这二十年的这个世界范围内的新自由主义的发展，就导致了进一步的贫富差异的扩大。我补充一下，他是说一九七九是百分之五十七，二零零四二十五年后是百分之五十七，现在是三分之二，现在是三分之二，已经更增加了。对，那五年后又怎么了？对，而且他还说，就是明年或者今年有 ten million 一千万的。美国人民将会失去他们的房屋、住房啊，因为这个金融危机。而且呢，现在主要是金融危机，它的后果是我们中国为美国买单。美国人现在会说：“哎呀，如果我们有了问题，我们可以向向中国销售我们的产品，我们可以从中国借钱啊，我们可以从中国那里得到我们所需要的。”所以说呢，他凭借什么？凭借就是他发行的美元货币。然后我们中国呢就会购买它的美元的资产，但是实际上呢，这个我们得到的就是一堆纸，一堆纸币，啊，它没有任何的真实的价值。呃，另外包括像他也讲到那个失业率也在也在增加，呃，这个贫富差异也在继续的扩大，等等。呃 ，OK。You can go on now. I'm, I'm going to draw a picture of China's balance of payments because President Obama is supposed to come here next month and uh, next week, I think. And I'm, I'm going to make some suggestions for what China should ask him. Here's basically what happens. China exports uh, manufactured goods uh, to the United States and it sells its companies to the United States. So it sells well, not only uh, the manufacturers, but it's actually selling its companies. And uh, like sometimes it gives them away, like Disneyland, to the US. So uh, they export to the US. The US pays in paper dollars. A dollar is an IOU. A dollar is uh, something saying it's money, but it's money that no one wants. Uh, it's just paper money. Adam Smith wrote in Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations, that no government in history ever has paid its debts, although some have pre pre pretended to do so. The United States is one of, just like Adam Smith said, it, is, it will never pay the debt, so China gets IOUs, uh, the dollars in payment for these, from the private sector. The, the, these dollars, uh, the exporter will pay, and he'll, they'll turn them over to the bank for, for RMB, the bank will turn it over to China's central bank and get IRB, and the central bank will have dollars. What will the central bank do with these dollars? Uh, they tried to buy American manufactured companies uh, and oil refineries, but America said, we won't sell you anything uh, for it. You can't do anything with it. China tried to buy Rio Tinto mine in Australia, but that didn't work out. So the Chinese central bank only can either buy U.S. Treasury bonds or junk mortgages. It, 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 it put some money into Wall Street and it lost a billion dollars in Blackstone Company when it tried to protect itself. So China uh, spend, uh, buys Treasury bonds from the U.S. That is government debt. The government uses these Treasury bonds for military spending and for foreign investment in China and uh, the, the money goes back to China. So this is the new kind of circular flow. 
Well, people in China are worrying that now that Americans owe so much money, they can't afford to buy goods and services anymore. I'll give you an example of how hard it is to live in America. And uh, uh, this should make you worry that the worst thing that could happen is that America is your future. It's not quite as bad as having neoliberal Russia as your future, but it's getting there. 40% uh, of American uh, wages have to go for housing, either for the mortgage or for the, uh, the pay and rent. 15, uh, uh, I'm going to go write these down, 40% uh, for housing, 15% to the banks for debt, bank debt. Uh, this is credit card debt, student loans, auto debt. 11% for social security tax. And between 15 and 20 percent, uh, altogether it's about 20 percent for uh, other uh, normal tax. That's income tax and sales tax. You add them all up, that's 86 percent of the budget of uh, wage earners uh, just to pay for finance, taxes, and insurance. Not food. That leaves. 14% for food, clothing, transportation, and everything else. That's not very much. That makes America. That means that as a result of neoliberal policy, Americans are only left with 14% of what they earn. How do they, how do they get by? They've got by every year by borrowing more and more money against the house. Uh, in many areas, a house uh, now costs uh, $300,000 in America. If, uh, as long as housing prices went up 10% a year, uh, a family could just sit in this house, do nothing, and make $30,000 just on the increased value of the house. That's more than they've earned the salary working for a living. So many people thought, well, why do we have to work for a living uh, when we can just own a house? Well, the reason they have to work is uh, they used uh, this $30,000 increase in the house, they'd refinance the mortgage. They'd borrow to finance their consumption. So although they only had 14% of their uh, salary uh, going for uh, goods and services, for food and transport, they could borrow money against their homes. This is, and uh, this was called by the head of the central bank in America, uh, treat your home like a piggy bank is if, look, it's uh, your money, you can borrow against it. But what happened is, now that house prices are going down, the debts are left in place. So here is basically the, uh, the house prices were going up like this and have now fallen. The, uh, as most of this is financed by debt, the debts have gone up like this. All of this is what's called negative equity. In other words, uh, the house price is down here, the debt is up here, and when the house prices fall, the debts remain in place. That's the problem that uh, people have in the United States. It's a problem they have in Europe. It's a problem they have in Australia, all over the world. And now people are having to repay this debt, and this means that instead of being able to borrow more than the 14%, they're negative, they have to uh, take their, uh, what they earn, and actually pay the banks uh, off and begin paying down this debt. Well, this means that many Americans don't have money to eat out at restaurants anymore. It means they don't have money to buy things. And so if you walk down uh, the big streets of New York or any other city, Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, you'll see empty stores. You'll see for rent signs. And uh, the commercial, uh, when people don't have enough money to buy, You've talked about the neoliberals in the market. The market is shrinking in the United States. Companies are going out of business. Companies are going bankrupt. Every month now, about 10 banks in the United States are going under because they're holding these bad mortgages uh, that can't be paid. So when uh, people talk about the American experience, this is the real experience they should be talking about, not some fantasy that's more like science fiction about how uh, life might be on Mars 
uh, just as well. This is the actual problem. So uh, the question is, what should China do to avoid ending up like Ameri in the, the American problem, uh, or like Russia? I work for the Latvian government. Latvia is way to the west of Russia, near the Baltic Sea. In Latvia, housing prices have fallen by 50% in the last year, and uh, the uh, GDP has fallen by 20%. Unemployment has spread. Latvia and the Baltic, Baltic neighbors were, uh, were run by neoliberals since 1991. The neoliberals said Latvia is the great success story. And Latvia today is broke. Uh, its uh, currency is under such pressure that it has to borrow from the International Monetary Fund and uh, the European community. And the International Monetary Fund says, we will lend you money uh, to the Latvian government only if you close down half of your hospitals, if you uh, lay off, fire half of your doctors and uh, tell them to emigrate, and if you close down half of your schools. That's how neoliberalism ends up. The other neoliberal country, the most successful neoliberal country in the world, that the United Nations said was the happiest country in the world, was Iceland. Uh, Iceland's housing prices in the last year have fallen by 75%. And uh, the unemployment is now 20%. Iceland is broke. Icelanders are, are being told they have to emigrate. They, they're losing their homes. They're having to emigrate so that the banks won't go after them to pay off uh, the bad debts. So what the neoliberals cited is their success story. The, uh, the happiest country in the world is now the most unhappiest country in the world, the worst uh, story. So the, the neoliberal future is Latvia, Russia, and Iceland. In Russia and Latvia, the average lifespan, how long a person lives, is shortened by 10 years. In Latvia, men, uh, it, when uh, Latvia got its independence from Russia in 1991, it's, uh, men lived about 60 years. Today, they live less than 50 years. Suicide is rising. Disease is rising. The uh, heart attacks and uh, uh, strokes uh, are, the, are among the highest in Europe. So the neoliberalism has brought disease. When Latvia was independent from Russia in 1991, there were 200 hospitals. At the beginning of this year, there were only seven hospitals in Latvia. The IMF told them, too many, you have to have only three hospitals. So disease is rising. This is neoliberalism. You close down every part of the public domain that does not make money. Looks Then 一个拉脱维亚大家肯定没有在拉脱维亚刚刚从这个苏联脱离之前九一年的时候他们有两百家医院但是现在呢只有七家医院是吧这就是这个私有化民营化还有这个自由市场经济给他们带来的这个后果另外呢他开始在这之前还讲到那种
，在我们这，我们我们现在总是说计划经济不好，是吧？计划经济，我们现在都认为市场经济好，但是实际上呢，在一个国家当中，其实存在着大量的计划，包括在在市场经济国家当中，这政府、企业，包括我们个人，都是要进行计划。所以说，对于一个国家来讲，你如果完全没有计划的话，那么最后就会导致一些失控，会导致混乱。所以说他，他他其实也是，他是支持在一定程度上啊，他是支持这个计划。我们在我们现在这个计划已经成了一个坏词了，一个 bad bad bad。是 neoliberal 搞出来的吗？啊，就是就是 neo l i b e r a l 这个搞出来，就是新自由主义搞出来。在新自由主义里面，它就是计划肯定是坏的，要么就是自由市场、自由竞争，是吧？但是对他来讲，实际上计划其实有它的。好的一面，我们不能够完全的忽视这个计划。OK， please. So,、uh, my warning to you is not to let China go further along the neoliberal path,、uh, to end up、uh, in the way that Latvia, Russia, and Iceland walk,、uh, wound up. In Russia, they calculated that the population is shrinking so much from emigration. Lower birth rates and just、uh, suicides. That by the year 2050, in another 40 years, Russia will have lost more population as a result of neoliberalism than it lost in all of World War II fighting. So today, international conflict is not military anymore. The way that nations、uh, conquer other nations today is not military because nobody can afford it.、Uh, it's、uh, financial. And it's ideological. You conquer other nations by getting them into debt to you,、uh, and by getting them to indebt their own population. By having, if you can get an economy to make its people go into debt and to make its、uh, companies go into debt, then they will shrink, and the market will be destroyed. That's the what is the result of the neoliberal policy. For instance, all of you in China have seen real estate prices go up and up and up, and、uh, the neoliberals. Many people think that this means China is getting richer, and of course it does mean, in one sense, that China is getting richer. The problem is that suppose、uh, you're setting out to life. What's going to happen when uh, you uh, form a family and have to buy a house? You're going to have to go deeper into debt than your parents ever had to do, had to do. Uh, 30 years ago, people had their property.、Uh, they had security of tenure where they were li living, just like they did in Latvia and Russia and even the United States. Now, in order to afford a house, you have to go into debt for almost the rest of your life. That's a result of the neoliberal tax policy. And when、uh, in Latvia there is a flat tax, not a progressive income tax. But a flat tax on labor of 59 percent, not just the、uh, this 11,、uh, 31, but 59 percent flat tax, and almost no tax at all, less than one percent of the tax on property.、Uh, so this means that if a government doesn't tax the landowners, if a government does not tax the rich, it has to tax labor and industry. And so, in every country, the neoliberals have taken over. They've lowered the taxes on the rich. They've raised the taxes on the workers and on the population as a whole. They've shifted the tax burden off wealth onto property. This again is just the opposite of what Adam Smith said. Adam Smith said that Europe had a problem, and that is, a thousand years ago, European countries were conquered by invading armies. And the heads of the armies gave all of the land to their own officers that conquered it. This was the Norman invasion of England in 1066. Similar invasions all throughout Europe.、Uh, the people,、uh, the military chieftains, became the new landlords, and they got hereditary、uh, rents of the land. And for the next thousand years, for the last thousand years, Europe has tried to say, how do we prevent having this aristocracy? That doesn't work. That simply lives idly, and that gets its money without working off the land. John Stuart Mill called、uh, this land rent and the land gain the unearned income, unearned wealth, basically. And he said you can define land rent as what landlords make in their sleep. That is, without working, without doing anything of their own, landlords have made money by having the the state build roads. Provide 
uh, sewage and water and electricity and, and more transportation. And every time the government spends money on improving society, the landlords have benefited. But they don't pay the tax. And the tax has been shifted onto labor and industry burdening the country. And Adam Smith said, if England is going to have to uh, compete with the rest of the world and be an industrial exporter, it's going to have to tax the land uh, because uh, the land is, has no cost of production, the land sites are free, and the value of uh, a land site is, is created by the state and by the, the level of prosperity. Adam Smith said, don't tax labor and industry. And that's what uh, his predecessor, the French physiocrat, said. The liberals don't want to tax property. They only want to tax labor and industry. So in every country in which neoliberals have taken over, they've dismantled manufacturing. Look at what they've done in Russia. Russia had a balanced economy. Uh, there was manufacturing. Today, it has all, very little manufacturing and is simply an oil exporter and a minerals exporter. It, uh, so the neoliberals have turned Russia into a third world country. The Russian skilled labor is leaving, and uh, the money is uh, capital flight uh, is leaving out of Russia to buy British sovereigns uh, and other things. Okay, very important. Uh, he said this point, I think it's very important, so I'll explain it to you. He said that the new-free country 一般要实行这个新自由主义政策引入竞争的话，它一般就会要降低税率。你跟扎切尔他们都是这样做的。但是降低税率的同时，那么它必然会增加对劳动的征税，因此呢，它就会导致这个对大众、普通劳劳动大众、工人对他的税收会增加。因此呢，他刚才也讲到了这个约翰斯特亚诺密穆尔或者密尔啊 ，John Stuart Mill。And the Adam Smith, Adam Smith, these are all we study in English. People think that the old Soviet Union, it praised the new Soviet Union. These people are actually against the state government. Especially, they think that the old Soviet Union, it generally would make the landlord, the landlord, the owner of the land, 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 新修一个地铁，那么这个地铁会使这个地表的这个建这些建筑物啊，这些东西会升值。但是呢，这些所有者他们不会支付这个相应的税收，这些税收都落到了普通民众的这个头上。所以说，地主是是受益者。但是呢，这个新自由主义政策，它与此同时，它保护了那些土地的所有者，但是它损害了制造业、工工商业。所以说，俄罗斯呢，它最后的结果实行新自由主义的结果就是。它的制造业大大的衰弱了，但是它的像这些石油、勘探呐、啊、一些房地产，这些就产生了一些，这个这个我们所谓的大鳄，导这也是导致这个社会不公平的一个很重要的原因。OK。So I think you can see the point that I'm getting at. I was I came here to talk about the global financial crisis, and the crisis is created. It's the inevitable outcome of America and other countries following neoliberal policies and going deeply into debt. Now, uh, many Chinese officials and professors I've spoken to said, uh, well, look, there's a reason we're neoliberal. Uh, for hundreds of years, we had uh, dictatorships by a wealthy oligarchy, and then under Mao, we had state uh, planning that caused problems, and we wanted to go to the other extreme. We wanted uh, something different. Well, uh, and they thought uh, that was the only choice. But that wasn't the only choice. Of course, there was uh, extreme central planning until 30 years ago. But uh, the solution wasn't to go to the opposite extreme or any extreme at all. Uh, the solution was to go right down the middle and have a mixed economy. The state did many positive things in every country of the world. I mentioned that in Europe and America, public medicine, roads, public utilities, electric power, airlines, all of these were done by the state. And more important, the state provided regulation. In the United States, in 1890, they, uh, the government created an anti-monopoly commission to prevent monopolies from overcharging consumers. There was a regulatory commission for electric utilities. So uh, when people produced electricity or telephone service, they, they had to price 
the electricity and the phone service according to what their cost of production was. Uh, and they were, able, they were able to make a given rate of profit, like 7 or 8 percent, but they were not able to charge a price that would give them an extra super profit or economic rent. They were re uh, regulated to prevent market gouging. When the free mar when neoliberals talk about the free market, they mean a market free for criminals, free for uh, gouging. In America, there are no more, there is no more any prosecution for financial crime. Okay. You can become a financial criminal and not be prosecuted. That's called the free market, but it used to be called criminal behavior. Okay, just a while. 他刚才讲到，就是关于这个我们现在对国有企业的态度。呃，我们现在都认为应该是国退民进，国有企业，包括我们的电力啊、自来水啊、交通啊、铁路啊，我们现在都认为应该把它全部都民营化，放在这个私人的手中，由私人企业来经营，这样比较好。但是他他刚才举的这个例子就是说，他恰恰认为，像这种事关国计民生的，叫做 public utility， 叫做公共事业行业，它由政府来掌控。更好，因为由政府来掌控这些行业的话，那么政府会根据它的这个成本来确定一个相对来讲合理的价格，这样所有民众的利益都可以得到保护。那么现在相反，在八零年里根上台了以后，美国实行的这个政策就是 deregulation， 就是解除管制、放松管制。英国就是呃私有化、民营化，那么最后的结果呢，就是导致这些行业它的价格上升。他们原初的目的是想引入竞争，降低价格，但是最后的结果并并不是这样的。所以说，他认为这种、这种、这种，呃，民营化、私有化的政策是非常错误的。这些行业，这个跟我们的这个平常的想法，现在流行的观点其实是完全相反。我们这点这个要说一下啊。OK， 可以说。One thing neoliberals do not believe in is a free market in ideas. Uh, the neoliberalism came basically from the University of Chicago, where I went to school, and uh, their first experiment was the Pinochet's Chile. The first thing you have to do to create a market is assassinate the president and take over the government. Uh, there was a revolution, and they overthrew the democratic government in Chile. Neoliberals require a dictatorship in order to succeed. The, the next thing, the first thing the neoliberals did in Chile was close every economic department. They were all closed down except for the Catholic University in Chile that used its books. The second thing they did was close down every social science department in Chile so that nobody could hear any ideas apart from neoliberal ideas. The third thing they did was begin to assassinate the labor leaders, assassinate professors who had other ideas, they started an assassination team through Argentina, Latin America, and they began to blow up powers in the United States with people who didn't believe in neoliberal ideas. So the conclusion is, if you want a free market, you have to be willing to kill everybody who disagrees with you and everybody who has ideas and teaches economic history or teaches uh, an alternative. If you let them teach an alternative, they will not believe in neoliberalism. They must be killed. And you have to realize that just as neoliberalism kills populations, as they do in Russia and uh, uh, Iceland and Latvia, they literally have resulted, resorted uh, to closing down, uh, to assassination. In the United States, uh, the Chicago schools, the neoliberals, have taken over all of the economic journals. I teach at the University of Missouri in Kansas City, and we, we are the alternative to the neoliberals there. When my students graduate, they want to get a job teaching in universities. And in order to get uh, promoted in a university in the United States, you have to publish in what's called a refereed journal, a prestigious journal. But all the prestigious journals are controlled by neoliberals, and they will only publish articles that agree with them. So if my students want to write about economic history, if my students want to write about the history of economic thought, if they want to write about debt and the problems of debt, if they want to talk about wealth distribution, they can't get published and then they don't get promoted. And so the only way of getting promoted is to say what the neoliberals say. That is not a free market. 
That is a dictatorship, an intellectual dictatorship. Okay, and okay. you need an intellectual dictatorship if you are going to be a neoliberal. Okay. That's the way out. 我們今天在大學教室裡面宣講的東西<笑> 后来是暗杀杀死了很多不同政见者创始人代表的天天我们的宣扬他的主张大學大學所有的大學都關了那么你在美国的话呢如果要讲有一个升职的话在大学教要赞成或明或暗的要赞成他们的观点因此他自己的学生毕业了以后要想在大学里面找到一个教职要想获得自己的升迁都是相对来讲都是很困难的这也是他自己的一种对新自由主义的一个切身的体会 OK, please Now obviously, what I've been describing is an extreme situation Russia is an extreme situation Latvia is an extreme situation Iceland is an extreme situation. America is an extreme situation. England is an extreme situation. The virtue of China is that you're not an extreme situation and that the neoliberals have not been able to do in China what they were able to do in all of these other countries. This is why you're immune from the global financial crisis. You have succeeded in avoiding the ne uh, problems caused by neoliberalism in these other countries because of your long tradition and your long mutual support and the, uh, just the genius of uh, the people that you have done. So the question is, how are you going to survive in a world where the rest of the world is going in crisis? Uh, there's a general agreement that what we're having now is not a depression. A depression goes back to norm, uh, normal or a recession. A recession is a, a curve. Here's progress. And there's supposed to be a curve. So if you have a recession, it's supposed to somehow go back to normal. The world is not going to normal, back to normal. What happens last year and this year is a split. The rest of the world is going down like this. Where will China go? Will it go up? Will it go here? And what shall it, uh, how should it negotiate when President Obama comes here next week? So I want to spend the rest of the time and talking about that, because that's what I've been discussing uh, with officials in Beijing. The first thing you should realize is that uh, many of you know that Pref uh, President Obama was elected because people, uh, he promised change. What you may not know is that there hasn't been any change. And people are very angry at Mr. Obama now. And his popularity rating has fallen in America 
faster than George Bush's popularity. <laughs> uh, because there, and not only that, the, uh, the right wing in America has uh, kept uh, saying, don't have socialized medicine, that now 60% of Americans think that socialism is a good word. That's the result of neoliberalism. The final stage of neoliberalism is socialism. They, uh, that's the irony. Just as the final stage of socialism was neoliberalism. It's sort of uh, talking about cycles. Uh, that's the kind of cycle. There was a swing from one extreme to another. So uh, last week, there were uh, elect annual November elections in the United States. Uh, there were only two governors uh, were elected. They were both Republicans. People voted against uh, the Democrats because they were angry at Obama, and the young people, the people under 30, who had voted uh, so heavily in favor of Obama, stayed home. In America, we call that voting with your backside. You just don't vote, and turnout was very low. People have got discouraged in the political process. So you're going to be dealing with a president who's trying to make himself more popular at home by coming to China, and get it done. The first thing that the Chinese officials are worried about is the dollars going down in price. Uh, China has linked its dollar, to, uh, its current the RMB, to the dollar because uh, it holds so many dollars. And if the RMB goes up against the dollar, or if the dollar goes down, then China will lose money in RMB. The government will show a loss on its American investments. It does, obviously, you don't want to have to take a loss. Uh, you don't want America's problem to become your problem. And so what should China do? Uh, one thing that it might do is what France and Germany did in the 1960s, 40 years ago. When the United States dollar was weakening as a result of the Vietnam War, Germany and France said, uh, we are going to turn in our dollars for gold unless you give us a guarantee that if the dollar goes down, you will reimburse our, our central banks, our government, for the losses by uh, making us whole so that we have the same amount of Deutsche Marks or uh, French francs. And America gave them that guarantee. China should say, uh, if you want our currency to go up so we don't sink along with you, America's like a drowning economy trying to pull China down. And it says, if, if we stay afloat, then you have to compensate us for our losses. That's the very first thing. Now, Americans are going to, they always say no after what other countries want. So China uh, will say, that, well, then you have to sell us your industry. You want to buy our industry. You're spending your money over, uh, American investors are buying Chinese stocks. They're buying Chinese bonds. They're buying Disneyland. They're buying companies here. You have to let us buy companies in America. And again, American government will say, no, you can't do that. We have national security concerns. We own America. We don't sell it to any foreigners. So then China, I think, should say, that's all right. We won't use our dollars to buy out your companies over there. We'll use our dollars to buy out American companies in China. We'll buy out the American banks in, the, uh, in China. We'll buy the American factories in China so that China will gain ownership of uh, what they have, they have given away to the Americans under neoliberalism. You'll, uh, the Americans uh, will get paid the dollars back that the companies report on their balance sheet, their companies are worth, and companies report their book value. Every company every year reports what the, uh, uh, what the capital investment it's made. China will give them back these dollars and say, we don't want any more dollars. The second thing is, uh, what will China do when it runs uh, uh, an export surplus? It doesn't want more dollars. No country in the world wants any more dollars. Earlier this year, I was in Malaysia, and Prime Minister Mahathir uh, told me that uh, he thinks that uh, Malaysia should stop exporting and begin uh, using uh, a domestic economy to support the domestic market. Now that you and China have built so many factories and have so much productive capacity, if you can do what the Americans did. You can develop your internal market and sell your products to the Chinese population by uh, regulating wages, by raising wages, by raising living standards, and produce for yourself. If you're going to give away your, your products 
for paper dollars and for paper currency, you might as well give it away for paper currency to your own people because it'll be given away one way or another. And the circular flow you should have is not to America and back and then uh, financing America's military. The circular flow should be between your employers and their empo employees, the workforce. Uh, the Chinese labor should have the uh, wages that enable it to buy what they produce. In classical economics, that's called Say's Law. That's what all the classical economists talked about. Labor needs to uh, buy what it produces. And the way the American economy got rich in the 19th century was not the neoliberal way, not by lowering wages, but by raising wages. Because the American government published statistics showing that when uh, wages uh, went up, workers ate better, they were uh, healthier, they uh, spent more money on education, and they were more productive. So the more wages go up, and this would be especially in the Chinese countryside, the more productivity will go up. And you can be an even more productive, an even richer economy by raising your living standards and your wage rates, by using your output to support your domestic population. <laughs>在我们中国人出席主义啊 因为七十年代的时候美元就已经不再和黄金挂钩了 那在这种情况下呢，我们必须要他给我们一个承诺。如果说你们没有贬值的话，那么你就必须给我其他方面的补偿。第二个方面呢，他讲到了就是，其实美国也是非常自私的，非常的这个可以说是不不公平。我们
Okay, please. Some students at other universities and even some officials have said, but if we do what you say, isn't, isn't that against the rules of the World Trade Organization, the WTO? And uh, my answer is China should do just what the United States has done with the World Trade Organization. Ignore all of its rules. The United States has always broken all of its rules. Earlier this summer, it uh, illegally imposed uh, steel tariffs against the ITO. The United States motto is, do as we say, not as we do. So China should say, also, just ignore the WTO rules, but not just one. It should break about 200 rules, as many as it can, because there's only one court in the ITO, and it takes five years to hear a case. If you break 200 rules, it'll take 50 years for them to even uh, bring it to court, and there'll be a teeny fine that you'll have to pay if you're guilty. It's worth breaking the rules, pay the fine, you'll get rich. By the time they hear it, the other countries will get poor. That's the American strategy. That's the strategy you should learn from, because it works. Uh, I work, I've moved very fast now in policy. That's a perfect bill. I, want, I think this is a good time to begin to take questions, because I've moved so rapidly that there should be a long discussion after this. Uh, OK. Uh,最后他刚才讲了一点就是关于这个WTO的问题，大家已经都听明白了吧？我们中国如果说是要遵守这个WTO的协议，是吧？他说我们其实可以完全无视，无视这个WTO的协议，因为美国也是这样做的，
America wants you to export raw copper that it will manufacture into high-priced materials and sell back to you in the form of manufacturing. And you should say, that's what the third world did, that's how Argentina went broke, we're not a third world country, we're not going to do that. But since you're putting the uh, tariffs on what we export, it happens these companies may be owned by Americans. We're buying out that company. We want, don't worry, we won't export to you anymore. We're buying out the company and we're now going to uh, produce in China itself, not for you. You'll have to produce your own exports. And the Americans will say, but we can't produce these goods. We've dismantled our industry. We've gone neoliberal. And uh, you say, well, that's your problem. We don't want your problem to be our problems. China. 
So Krugman gets it backward, as he always has. If you win the Nobel Prize, that doesn't mean you're smart. That means tunnel vision. That's what it's given for. Uh, if you're a, a condition for being a professor in the United States is not understanding how the economy works. If you understand how it works, you're not suited to be a neoliberal professor. Thank you. <笑>他们不像我们那样崇拜诺贝尔奖的这个科鲁格曼也是会说错的他说科鲁格曼说的都是错家伙是吧他科鲁格曼说的我们中国人只去独立高了以后然后美国人支持了美国人的这种高消费
uh, and they were getting less and less, and there wasn't enough money to pay pension because all the money from the buyout was used to pay the banks. Now that's the case whether it's a management buyout, or whether it's a corporate raider, or whether it's workers' buyouts. In order to buy out a company with debt, you have to use all of your income to pay the debt. You don't have money for new capital. American Airlines didn't have money to buy new airplanes because it was paying the debt. And so people weren't flying American Airlines anymore. Uh, the, uh, the whole American economy has become loaded down with corporate buyouts and junk bonds. And what used to be uh, stock ownership is now turned into working for the bondholders. Now this again is just exactly the opposite of what the classical economists talked about and advocated in the 19th century. From the uh, followers of Saint-Simon in France through Marx, all of the classical economists said, we want to get rid of the banking we've had in the past. We think banks should be more like mutual funds. They should, a bank should provide uh, credit to a company and take payment in the form of stock, not debt. And we should be paid dividends, not interest, because when a company uh, slows down and earns less, it can cut back the dividends without going bankrupt. But if a company borrows, like uh, the corporate buyouts happen, then when you miss a payment, you go bankrupt. General Motors went bankrupt. All the big American companies are going bankrupt now. That's the result of buyouts. And when they go bankrupt, they wipe out the pension funds, or they threaten to wipe out the pension funds. This is the whole problem, that the buyouts uh, have loaded, the effect of the buyouts has been to load the economy down with debt, and today, corporate debt is a higher than any level it was until just before the Great Depression in the uh, 1920s. So uh, the reason that there is a global financial crisis is largely because of corporate buyouts, whether by management, or by labor, or by corporate raiders, or by other buyers. Buyouts are the problem. The, uh, the companies no longer uh, are units with the workers and the customers. Uh, it's just the companies, uh, industrial companies, have been turned into financial firms. And a new word has been added to the English language that didn't exist 20 years ago, financialization. And that means you treat industrial firms as if they're financial vehicles to extract interest in a predatory way. That's uh, the problem with bias. Okay, 其实现在这个新自由主义它的这个模式之下它是倾向于保护资本主义方面工人来说过公司的财产买下来以后
是运转，对不对？哎，运转，所以他们的股资越来越低。对。后来就弄不下去，所以事实上是不存在。这是一个矛盾，对吧？就是如果是管理层收购的话，那么这个公司通常来讲，它的效率可能会提高，它的手段可能就是要减轻员工啊，提高效率啊。但是如果是由工人来控制这个工厂的产权的话，它的债务。它的债务的问题，还有它的这个效率的问题。那么大家都是这个工厂的股东，就跟我们以前的这个国有企业、老的国有企业一样，大家可能这个工作的动力啊，有可能会下降。这确实是一种矛盾，所以说可能最好的结果可能是一种平衡。但是现在在新自由主义的这个模式下，这个平衡肯定是被打破了。现在的这个力量肯定是资方比这个劳动这一方要强。
Today, the neoliberals have uh, cut the capital gains tax to only half of the normal income tax, and that is one of the things that has deindustrialized the United States because it's easier to buy and sell companies or real estate and make a gain than to actually build factories and employ people. Uh, it's taxed much less, so the tax system is deindustrialized countries. So what China needs to do is the kind of tax system and public welfare spending uh, and minimum wage law that the United States had until 30 years ago. Corruption? Obviously, uh, America in uh, the last bank crisis in the 1980s, about 200 bankers went to jail for corruption. Uh, this time around, the FBI, the credit rating firm, has said that almost every single package of mortgages in the United States has fraud and consumer fraud. But not a single person has gone to jail in the United States, except for one person who walked into the police station with his hands up and say, I surrender, I stole $60 billion, and that was Bernie Madoff. But not a single person has been arrested because they've decriminalized financial crime in the United States. So uh, what you want is to reinstitute uh, criminal proceedings uh, like America used to have before 30 years ago. 30 years ago was the big change. Everything changed all over the world, not only in China, but in Russia, America, Europe, uh, all over, all of a sudden, uh, uh, criminals had a new word for what they do. They don't call it crime, they call it neoliberalism. <笑>大家都听明白了刚才最后那个问题这个好像还是很容易理解他说就是美国怎么样来保护这个社会公平它的几种政策两种吧第一种就是最低工资保障是吧minimum wage 落啊第二种就是这个超额累金税那么但是呢现在在这个薪资有主义的这个这个这个主张之下这个最低工资保障最低工资它也一直都没有变过啊而这个超额累金税呢现在他们他说当时刚刚实行这个政策的时候一百年
Uh, yeah, yes, that Samuelson proved mathematically that China should still be producing paper flowers for export. Uh, that China should not have industrialized. The uh, Samuelson theory mathematically accepts everybody's productivity just exactly as it is. It looks at the existing productivity, not the future. And I think I told you that uh, finance lives in the short run. A neoliberal economics is equilibrium economics. Uh, Samuelson said that if everybody specializes in doing things, uh, some people do it cheaper, but he assumed that uh, uh, everybody would produce something. China would still be producing paper flowers, not industrial uh, products, and you would still all be poor if you would have financed that. Uh, no country has ever developed by following the theories in that book. They remain poor by following the theories. Mr. Samuelson says that if you just leave things alone, trade will automatically balance and everybody will be equal. Well, in the last since Mr. Samuelson wrote the book, the whole world has become more unequal. The whole world is going out of balance. If it were in balance, the United States wouldn't owe four trillion dollars worth of debt, and China wouldn't have two trillion dollars worth of bonds to finance the military spending all around it. Didn't Mr. Samuelson, in his mathematics, include military spending? Uh, if you look in the index, do you find gunboats there? Where are the gunboats? Where's the military? That's what the economy is all about. Where is the future? Uh, it, uh, Samuelson treats the economy as if it were all existing at a moment in time and we're going to be that way forever with existing productivity. Samuelson says that uh, labor productivity has nothing to do with what you're paid. Uh, for wage, wages can go up or down and labor productivity is the same. Samuelson is an argument for making labor poor. Samuelson's book tells you how to be poor. If Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, his book should be called The Poverty of Nations. Uh, so I, I would just hope that you're reading anti-Samuelson. And in fact, the University of Wuhan now is translating my book on American protectionist uh, takeoff uh, that will be available in another month. And the, uh, uh, the uh, publishing company that published my super imperialism in Beijing uh, it is now translating in Tianjin my history of trade theory that shows all the theories in the last 200 years have been against Samuelson. Uh, so if you, in another month, you can read what Adam Smith and everybody else wrote against Samuelson to show all of, I have a whole chapter just on the mistakes that he makes. <笑>我們都當然有人真的在底下不知道該做何改一下。现在这个主流经济学像这个教授他刚才也谈到了 Great Transformation 大转型实际上从买得到现在大陆已经有了实际上从这个资本主义啊从以前的这个传统社会发展到资本主义按照私密加上私密这些人的观点新自由主义的观点它无疑是一种社会的进步但是实际上在他们经济史学家看来在卡
那么有消费者证明，要有生产者证明，有社会组织力推它。但是在实际当中，他他们研究的是真实世界当中的经济学 ，real economics in real world。那么在真实的世界当中，这个交换过程它其实就充满了矛盾，充满了痛苦，充满了挣扎、斗争。你买卖的时候，不像医学里面所描述的，这就是一种哈利波特感情。这里面很多很多的这个这个感情的因素在这里纠结的。所以说这个都是多看其他的一些不同的观点啊，可以让你。Okay, I, was, okay, I want to say something else about that. How many of you here are from the economic school? Uh -huh. well, not, many, not many of us. Not many. At the beginning of Mr. Samuelson's book, he's, uh, it's hard to uh, make non-economists believe this, but at the beginning of Mr. Samuelson's book, he says the criterion for a good economic theory is not realism. It's whether the assumptions are consistent. Now that's what they say when you go to a movie. You want you want to go away from a movie and say, wait a minute, that couldn't have happened that way. It wasn't consistent. Novel novels should be consistent. Literature, movies, drama. But uh, Samuelson said, as long as they're consistent, assume this. And so in America, people laugh at economists uh, for making assumptions that have nothing to do with the world. M Mr. Samuelson's mathematics are very good, but they're irrelevant. What's the point about making good mathematics about how life could be on Mars if it were different uh, and it was a fictitious? Samuelson's textbook is about science fiction. It's not about the economy. That's the problem. Yeah, it's a fantasy. Yeah, it's a fantasy. Sorry, last question for this boy. Samuelson may I ask my question in Chinese? Yes. Okay, he has two questions. The first one is that in the 1920s and 1930s, there was a Great Depression happened in America. And uh, at that time, the Hayek and uh, John Maynard Keynes gave their different explanation to this depression. So uh, which one do you agree with them, or both you disagree? Uh, Keynes uh, had the correct explanation. Keynes attributed the Great Depression to the inter-allied debts, to the war debts. It was uh, after World War I, America insisted that Europe pay it for the arms that it had sold uh, uh, Europe before America entered World War I. And Europe owed America so much money that it had to demand huge German reparations. And so uh, Germany was left bankrupt. And uh, finally, uh, the, um, it had to borrow the money from America. America would uh, use German, uh, would essentially, uh, Germany would pay England, England would, uh, for reparations, England would pay America for its armed debts, American investors would lend money to Germany, so that uh, German municipalities and states, so that Germans could uh, afford to pay England and keep the circular flow. But to do this, America had to keep the interest rates so low that American investors would want to uh, lend money to Germany. So America in uh, the 1920s was like Japan after the Plaza Accords. It kept up interest rates low, flooded the economy with money, the stock market went way up, and the housing market went way up, and then it crashed. So the pr what caused the Great Depression was debt. That's not what Hayek uh, advocated. The system Hayek advocated was all in favor of debt. He said economic planning should be concentrated in the banks, and the banks should uh, sell more and more debt until the whole population spends its life repaying debt. That's freedom. And what is, what is serfdom is the government protecting the population. And Keynes said, that's crazy. You're a fascist. And he's right. Hayek is the economics of fascism. And uh, what he calls serfdom is what you call freedom. That's it. 
，三年以前、四年以前不流行了啊，但是后来金融危机出了以后，出没有啊，现在反正是主流又开始盛行。相反，他的这个他对这个哈耶克的观点，可能跟我们现在很多大陆的知识分子是不一样的。他说凯恩斯的那个确实是保护民众的自由 （freedom）， 而这个哈耶克的那个通往奴隶之路呢，它其实是法西斯主义，是吧？法西经济的法西斯经济的法西斯主义。它是攻击国家做一些那个，就国家这么做会造成人民变成一种像奴隶制度，它是正好是相反的，让私人去那个什么造成这个我们还要多学习。这个这个我现在还没有完全的领悟，知道吗 ？Sorry， 因为。
The universities are being financialized and neoliberalized, and this is part of the phenomenon I'm talking about all over the world. Of course education should be a public utility. That's how the America got rich, by educating its labor force and by paying labor enough money so that kids didn't have to go to work when they were teenagers, they could afford to spend the four years in college. That's what has made America a uh, uh, high productivity economy and attracted immigrants. But now, all of that's being reversed, and it's being reversed in England, too. They're charging money for schools in England. The whole world is doing uh, what you've described in China, and the, uh, people are protesting all over the world against this. And, and it's part of an overall approach, not only to schools, but to the whole economy and all the public utilities. That's the problem that I came to China to discuss. Okay, thank you. New Public Administration or New Public Management, okay? Also supported by the New Liberalism. Ti 它是一个比效率更高或者至少是两者应该是平行的同样的另外的一个目标在伦理学哲学里面把它叫做价值所以说呢他们的这些很多学者在美国很多学者他其实是反对新公共管理运动也反对这个薪资有主义最后我再做一个简短的总结同学们如果你们还有很多其他的问题我想今天晚上是不可能把所有的问题都能够都回答清楚那么同学们可以通过今天的互联网通过这个email和这个哈尔森